scripture reading this morning will come from Luke chapter 12. It's Luke chapter 12, starting in verse 16. And he told them a parable, saying, The land of the rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, What shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. Morning, everyone. Good to be with you again, and uh, very thankful for our the time we share together always. We're very proud and, and uh, gracious to be Christians. If you are one, we certainly hope that you uh, have that zeal and that love and that desire. And if you are not one, we hope that you have the zeal and desire to become one. And uh, our lesson this morning, we hope that that will help to generate that kind of interest. And we encourage you to uh, get your Bibles and use them as we're going to be studying uh, from God's Word for a few minutes. And in fact, I'd like you to turn to Matthew chapter 25 while you're while we're having our introduction here, <clears throat> Matthew chapter 25, and our lesson title this morning is On the One Hand, On the Other Hand, as our focus will be primarily verses 31 through 46, but before we look at that, I want to make some preliminary comments about uh, things leading up to this parable. We've been studying the parables of Jesus for some time, and, and uh, this, uh, in terms of uh, the nature of it, we uh, save to the chapter 25 really for the end of that kind of study. Uh, but I want you to notice that uh, chapter 24 and 25, if you have a Bible to have wor the words of Jesus are in red, there's a lot of red there. Um, not, much, not much black other than your verse numbers, but... Uh, uh, I point that out because Jesus is talking to his disciples from chapter 24, verses 1 through 3. That's the, uh, the first thing that we notice because what we're going to look at this morning is Matthew 25, 31 through 46, is pretty much a continuation of his answer to his disciples in the uh, first three verses of chapter 24. And it says, Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him to, to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to him, Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone will be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? There's two question marks, but really there's three questions. They wanted to know, first of all, when, uh, when will these things be that he's talking about, the destruction of Jerusalem? And he wanted to know also what will be the sign of your coming, and certainly in, in the judgment against Jerusalem, but also they wanted to know uh, what will be the sign of the end of the age. And so Jesus begins to uh, answer this in verse 4, and this is a continuation. He goes from one thing to the next, and he, uh, he makes some uh, discussion about... Uh, the events that are going to happen in Judah and Jer Jerusalem and Judea in those days. And, and uh, if you harmonize the other gospel accounts in Mark 13 and Luke 21, uh, also it even talks about Gentile armies coming in uh, and surrounding the city and that sort of thing. And so he's clearly uh, addressing the, the destruction of Jerusalem, which we now know to be roughly 40 years after Jesus said this. This was fulfilled in AD 70 when the uh, Roman Empire, who had already besieged the city about 67 AD, halfway through that year, I guess, somewhere in there. As I understand it, they besieged the city of Jerusalem for about three years or so. And, uh, and basically, they, uh, they toppled the, the, uh, the city. They, they uh, destroyed the temple, raised it to the ground. It was never built again. And so the fulfillment of uh, Jesus' prophecy is seen at that time. But he, uh, he gives various illustrations about the destruction of, of Jerusalem and the temple Clear down through verse 35. He says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. Mark my words, it's going to happen. But then he begins in verse 36, but of that day and hour no one knows, not even, no, not even the angels of heaven, but my father only. This seems to be the pivotal point in the chapter in which he begins to answer the last question, and that will, is what are the sign of the, the uh, end of the age? 
Uh, he didn't pinpoint a date as far as the destruction of Jerusalem is concerned, but he did give them the obvious signs that would precede it. This is what's going to happen. In fact, it's uh, very obvious when he says in verses 32 and following, Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the very doors. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things are fulfilled. So he's telling them there are signs. It's going to be very obvious to you, just as this parable I give you, it's going to be very near to you. You're going to be able to see it. You're going to identify it. And what's more is it's going to happen in the lifetime of many of the disciples that are standing here or uh, in terms of his, uh, his 12 here, his, his 11 really. And so he says, my words will by no means pass away. God cannot lie. This is going to happen. But he makes a very important point. Heaven and earth will pass away. When he says in verse 36, but of that day and hour, no one knows. No, not even the angels of heaven. Certainly the son doesn't know. Only the father it is uh, evidently in reference to that statement that heaven and earth will pass away. Now we're talking about the end of time, not the destruction of Jerusalem. Everything he says from that point on, the end of chapter 24, as he gives the illustration, as in the days of Noah, which makes sense. The entire world was destroyed, saving eight souls. There's only eight souls that were saved in that uh, worldwide catastrophe. And he says, just like that, it was then, so it shall be when the coming of the Son of Man comes in the last day. And he gives an illustration of two servants and about the, the one who uh, was not prepared, did not look for it, in fact, thought perhaps his, uh, sir, his master would not return. And uh, so there was the faithful and the unfaithful servants. And he begins chapter 25, and this is probably the most popular chapter if you're looking at one full chapter that deals with the end of time. This is usually one that people go to. There are three parables that are given in this chapter, and they are all relative to each other. The three parables of Matthew chapter 25 has the ten bridesmaids or the ten virgins, and it involves verses 1 through 13. And then, of course, then it was the servants and the talents, the parable of the servants and the talents, and verses 14 through 30. And then finally, uh, the parable of the sheep and the goats in verses 31 through 46. It has symmetry, this chapter, broken up into thirds and deals with the same basic idea. It's talking about the end of time, when the Lord returns, but they are different uh, and leading up to one another. They build off of one another because in the first parable, the ten bridesmaids, the ten virgins, it's basically be ever watchful for the Lord's return and basically be ready with reference to that. Remember how all ten of the virgins, uh, the bridesmaids were all ready to be to receive the, uh, the coming of the bridegroom. All of them were anticipating it. Every one of them were looking forward to it. They were all uh, seemed to share the same fervor and zeal, desire. It's just that he had delayed in his coming. And so as Jesus talked about the oil running out for some, because five of them did not have the foresight that perhaps he would be delayed in his coming and uh, would, uh, they'd run out of oil. But the other five, they anticipated that and they brought enough. And so it was not just simply watching, but watching with readiness. Be prepared for that. Anticipate the Lord's return. Don't just, don't just know He's coming, but anticipate His coming and do whatever it takes to be ready for His coming is the idea. And then after that, Jesus gives that parable of the servants and the talents, the three men. He gave one to one, five talents to another two and to another one, to each according to their own ability. All three of them were His servants. All three of them had the capability of doing something in his service, and two of them were very faithful in their tasks, even though they didn't have the same amount to start with, didn't have the same results with what they had worked. But one, the one talent man, he had one job. <laughs> he, had, he, had one, he had one thing to do. It was very much the same as the other two, but he had far less to work with, but it's still a lot. But he goes and buries it in the ground. He was afraid. He hid his Lord's money. Suppose that perhaps at the very least his, his master would praise him for, for at least protecting what was his. See, here you have what is yours and hands it back to him. But that wasn't good enough for the master. Where he says, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord to the other two men. He says to this man, you wicked and lazy servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Therefore, you ought to have deposit my money with the bankers that at my coming, I will receive back my own with interest. He ends up taking that talent, giving it to the one who has 10 talents and cast the lazy and wicked slothful servant in this particular case into outer darkness will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. 
Well, we know what that means in Scripture. That's talking about hell. It's talking about eternal condemnation. And so you have in that storyline that uh, there was this need to be faithful. While we're watching and anticipating the Lord's return, we are to be busy doing the Lord's will during that time until He returns. And then in this parable that we're about to look at, basically the idea is you need to be prepared to face the judgment. You need to not only be watchful in, in, in anticipation of Him working and doing His will, understanding the outcome if you don't versus if you do. In all three parables, you have good and bad. They are laid side by side. In the parable of the ten bridesmaids, you had five that were diligent. They were diligent, and you had five that were negligent. They were all on the same page up to a point, but they ultimately had neglected to do what they needed to do to ensure that they'd be ready for when the, when the bridegroom would show up. In other words, the Lord would return. And in the parable of the servants and the talents, you had the faithful two servants who did exactly what their master uh, expected of them. And you had the one who was unfaithful. He was wicked and lazy, the master called him. And then in the parable that we're looking at this morning, you had those who were prepared, those who were ready, those who had lived it, those who were uh, uh, walking with the Lord and at his coming, he, they would be on the right side. And in the parable, you'll notice that on the one hand and on the other. We're going to look at that in just a moment because he talks about both hands in this parable and one representing righteousness and eternal life and the other eternal condemnation. Can you see the symmetry in Matthew chapter 25? See how it all kind of comes together so nicely. This is the Lord's doing. And I think it's important for us to understand the, the profound nature in which Jesus taught here that we may be able to understand uh, to make modern application for us today that we likewise need to be watchful and vigilant, diligent to be ready for his return, always be working the work of Christ in our lives until he returns and understanding that if we do so, we will be on the one hand in judgment and if not, we'll be on the other. In verse 31 of Matthew 25, it says, When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then He will sit on the throne of His glory. All the nations will be gathered together to Him, before Him, and He will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And He will set the sheep on His right hand, but the goats on the left. Then the King will say to those on His right hand, Come ye blessed of my Father, and here the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. And the righteous answered him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and give you food? When did we see you thirsty and give you drink? When did we see a stranger and take you in? When did we see you naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, and inasmuch as you have done it to the least of these, my brethren, you have done it to me. Assuredly, I say to you that. But then he turns to those on the left hand and says, Depart from me, you cursed into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not take me in. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. And they also will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you? Hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you. And he also will answer them saying, Assuredly I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. On the one hand, you have the sheep. On the other, you have the goats. Now I'm not real knowledgeable about livestock, ladies and gentlemen. But as I understand it, uh, as I've read about the, is there some obvious significance? It's very trivial, I suppose, in one respect. But it is suggested it would have been easy for a shepherd to divide them out. Uh, it is suggested that the sheep were typically white with their wool and that the goats were typically dark gray or black in their, in their coat. And it would be easy to look and, and to sort that out. But the Lord doesn't need to be able to visually see the difference between people. Yeah, I don't know. You're talking about 2,000 years ago. Maybe there's different variations of goats and sheep today. But uh, whatever it was, the, the Lord who returned knew the difference. He knew uh, it was very obvious from a, a distance. I would think just the fact that they looked different, you know, 
A goat is not a sheep. <laughs> it's not a sheep would be there. But he was able to separate them. And isn't that interesting that he says that when he, when he comes in all his glory and he sits on the throne of his judgment and he says all the nations will be gathered to him, he's going to separate everybody like that. It's not that they look like that, but that he's going to separate them as a shepherd would divide those out, separate those out. And I suppose that is the difference and maybe the reason why any point would be made about the, the obvious nature of it is because to God it is very obvious who are the righteous and who are the wicked. And it is uh, very obvious to God who are the blessed and who are the cursed. And there is no one who can, who can hide that. There is no one who can come into the, <clears throat> as the, as the uh, parable of the, of the wedding feast, uh, someone can come in without the wedding garment on and sneak in and be acceptable. He was spotted. He was identified as, uh, as one who didn't belong there. And he was cast out into outer darkness while they were weeping and gnashing of teeth. In this judgment scene, what we notice here is that, first of all, the whole world judgment is in view by the statement of in uh, all the nations, by the statement of verse 32, all the nations will be gathered before him. In this judgment view, one would have to assume then that since God is going to judge the world based on not only the present time, whenever that is that he arrives, whenever he shows up, but it's going to he's going to judge the world for everyone who has lived before. Remember, Jesus says in John chapter 5 and 28 and 29, uh, Do not marvel at this, for all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. So he's talking about people who have already physically died, but they're going to be raised up to be judged. So all the nations that will be gathered before him uh, could not mean just whoever's a nation at the time. You know, if it's just down to China and Russia and the U.S. in, th in a thousand years, if we're still here, and there's, and there's no other nations that exist, it's not just going to be these three nations. It's going to be everyone who has ever lived since the time of Adam is going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, no matter what your nationality was or is, what your background was or is, everyone will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. There will be everyone called into judgment. That is very true. And that God will judge the entire world is easily seen in other passages such as 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verses 8 through 10. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. In verse 8 beginning, Paul says, "...in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ." These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. Indeed, the entire world will be judged on those who do not know God, K-N-O-W, and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I've often made the point as I uh, was studying Hebrews chapter 8 one time about all who will know the Lord and the spiritual intimacy that comes with that, I, I've come to the conclusion that perhaps that's what Paul's talking about here. Those who do not know the Lord is more probably a reference to the disciples who do not have a good relationship with him. Those who might be children of God in name only perhaps, but they don't know him in the sense of a spiritually intimate relationship that you might see uh, as compared to marriage, Ephesians 5, 22 through 33. It's a spiritual relationship. We are married to the Lord in that respect. And so when you think about that, to know the Lord in that way, if it is possible to become a Christian and wear the name of Christ and yet not know the Lord. And those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, wouldn't that be anybody who did not become a Christian and chose not to obey the gospel? It seems pretty evident to me anyway. So judgment is coming on the whole world. Everyone will be judged no matter who they are. But isn't it interesting when you get back to Matthew chapter 25 and you look at uh, by comparison to this here, he says that all the nations will be gathered to him, but he begins talking about two groups of people to whom he expected both of them to treat his disciples well. Did you catch that? He's talking to two groups of people in which he expected both of them to have treated his disciples well. What does an atheist have to do with that? Now, while this judgment is going to be against all people, including the atheist, his directive is given, ladies and gentlemen, write it down, to disciples about disciples. Two disciples 
about disciples. The context is clear. Inasmuch as you have done it to the least of these, my brethren, you've done it also to me. He's talking to disciples about disciples. When he turns around and says to the cursed, inasmuch as you have not done it to the least of these, my brethren, you have not done it to me. What would anybody outside of Christianity have to do with Jesus Christ? Not knowing really much about him or his religion, really. Everyone will be judged, including the guy I just described. But he's talking about he's talking to disciples about disciples. Not that makes sense, doesn't it? Let's go back to our chart here. In the ten bridesmaids, these people all had something in common. Every one of these ten bridesmaids, these, these maidens, these virgins, they all were of the same group of people. Five of them were prepared and one was unprepared. One, was diligent, one group was diligent, the other was negligent. But he's talking about the same group of people, disciples, who are waiting for the Lord's return. Who's waiting for the Lord's return besides the disciple of Christ? And then in the next parable, he's talking about one master who has, he mentions three servants, right? He mentions three servants, but they were all his servants. There was no foreigner outsider in this picture. There was not somebody else from some other place. They all belong to the master. And he's talking about disciples. Disciples who were diligent, disciples who were negligent, disciples who were faithful, disciples who were unfaithful. Stands to reason that the last third of this chapter is talking about disciples as well. Especially when you take into account that he's, like I mentioned, it's either commendation or condemnation toward them as to whether or not they were good toward their fellow servants, the servants of Jesus Christ himself. If you want to make this real personal, you first must understand that while the whole world will be judged, all the nations will be brought before him. But he begins talking here in this dialogue about his judgment against his own disciples. Now that makes sense to us. Because as Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verses 17 and 18, the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it, if it comes to us first, then what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? I think it's a good cross reference for this Matthew 25, 31 through 46. Again, it was 1 Peter 4, 17 and 18. That's real important to us. But when we look at the, uh, the two sides, on the one hand, you have the sheep. Now, this is from all the nations, remember? And that makes sense to us as well, because did not Jesus say, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature? Did he not say, Matthew's account, to go make disciples of all the what? Nations? Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He says to make disciples of all the nations. So here he says, all the nations will be gathered before him. And of all that are gathered before him, as the sinner's in hones in on the, on the disciples of Christ, it stands to reason that every nation will be a disciple based on the command given. And Paul says by Colossians 1, about verse 24, that that command had been fulfilled at least to the point in his life at which he became an, an apostle. So, the judgment scene that was given to his disciples, his apostles of this day, a very future look at the end of time and what's going to happen at the end of time. And he says he's going to come and sit on the throne of his glory with all his holy angels with him and that every nation will be brought before him, which includes us. The United States wasn't a nation back then. We're going to be involved in that. Every not make where you're from. Everybody's going to be there. So it comes down to the two points. On the one hand, you have the righteous. He says that the righteous, he sets at his right hand as if you know they're like the sheep. Which makes sense. This man, he's the shepherd of the sheep. The sheep are, we are the sheep of his pasture. The scriptures are rife with examples, Old New Testament alike, about the idea that we as followers of God, as believers and lovers in God, are considered like sheep. Didn't David see that in himself? In Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leads me beside the still waters. It's a shepherd to lead any sheep. And, but then on the other hand, you have the goats. The goats among his disciples. When we get down to what he specifically says is interesting. Because in this comparative look at this to his disciples, the same rules applied to both, both sides of this. God did not expect more out of one than another. 
It was real simple. He says that uh, I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. And I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. And when they asked him, Lord, when do we see you in any of those situations and, and, and do anything for you? He says, assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Now, they did not evidently see Jesus in any of this. It was, I never even, maybe in this case, I've never even met you in the flesh. How is it then that I have ever fed you when you were hungry or gave you a drink when you're thirsty and so on and so forth? How did I ever help you? And he qualifies it. Inasmuch as you've done it to the least of these, my brethren, you've done it to me. That tells us something real special about our relationship with Christ. That whatever it is we experience in this life, he feels it too. As proof of that, in Acts chapter 9 and verse 5, we just studied, we just read this this morning. Acts chapter 9 and verse 5. In, uh, in the dialogue of that passage of Scripture, you have Saul of Tarsus who is on his way to Damascus with authority. He's got letters from the high priest. He's going to go to Damascus and he's going to persecute Christians there like he's been doing everywhere else. It's coming to it's a fever pitch. And, and everything's just he's in a frenzy. He's just chomping at the bit to take down more Christians. And while he's on his way, Jesus appears to him. His brightness shone brighter than the sun. We, we read it a lot. We refer to it just right this morning. And what Jesus said was simply identifying Saul, Saul. And then he lays down the charge. Why are you persecuting me? And he's like, who are you, Lord? And of course, he says, I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting question is there any evidence in bi biblical literature that Saul of Tarsus ever even met Jesus I don't know maybe he saw him perhaps maybe he was around when he was on the cross there is no biblical evidence he was around to see Jesus but that's not really the point is it Jesus says in the present tense of Acts chapter 9 and verse 5 he says I am Jesus whom you are not were are persecuting you are presently persecuting me Where's Jesus right now? Other than the fact he had shown up miraculously in terms of the, this vision to, to Saul of Tarsus, where has Jesus been this whole time? In heaven at the right hand of God. So Saul of Tarsus didn't lay a hand, not a finger on Jesus Christ. How is it then he's persecuting Jesus? If you follow the principle that we just studied and, and learned here in Matthew 25, we realize that if, if you... If you're feeding a hungry disciple who is the Lord's, it's the same as feeding him. And if you're giving a, a thirsty disciple a drink, it's the same as giving Jesus a drink. If you are taking care of a, a stranger that, is, that belongs to Christ, it's as though you're taking care of him. If you're clothing the naked among Jesus' disciples, it's as if you had done the same for the, our Lord Jesus Christ. Whenever someone who is sick or in prison has been visited and some kind of edification extended, perhaps prayers made over them or whatever, whenever we do that for the brethren, we're doing it to Jesus as well. And then the flip side is just as true. If we're not feeding and offering drink and clothing, taking them in or, or doing the necessary things, we're also not doing that to Jesus. I suppose one of the greatest, greatest uh, points of edification in the first century under such intense persecution, first at the Jews, uh, hands of the Jews, and then later by the Roman Empire itself as the decades would roll by, was to know that they were never really alone that Jesus, as he said, I'll never leave you as, as orphans. And everything they went through, when they would go through the crucible of fire, Jesus had gone through it with them. There was nothing that those early saints experienced that Jesus did not also experience. He might not have been there when they took the lash, but he took it with them nonetheless. Now there's something real powerful in that thought, that even today, has God ever changed? Is it just as true today that when you suffer for the cause of Christ, that Christ also gets the black eye? I know we want him here physically at a time like that. You know, if we could just if he just part the clouds and come down here and we can give him a big hug and cry on his shoulder, that would be wonderful. That would be pretty cool. Not just cool, it'd be wonderful. But he's not going to do that. In fact, if you want to see Jesus now, you want to see the life of Christ now, outside of who you are. It needs to be seen in our other brethren. Let the beauty of Jesus be seen in me, right? 
But isn't that something? That Jesus, as he's, he's talking here in the judgment scene, is suggesting that he experienced these things, or didn't, depending on which side, which hand he was talking to, because he shared that with his brethren. There's something powerful in that for you, if you're on the right side of it. There's something powerful in that, that he feels it when you, when you feel it. And then when your needs are there, it's as though his needs are there. We have a God so tuned in to us that that experience is real. So it makes sense to us then, if you think about it, that if we do good unto each other, that we're doing good unto the Lord. And if we mistreat or, or are neglectful of one another, then we're also mistreating and being neglectful of the Lord. It really goes back to that idea that there's nothing that you do in this life that does not have some effect on our Lord Jesus Christ. We've often talked about that. You know, I can sin against God by myself and you never be involved. I can sin against you. But either way, God is always the one that we're sinning against. Either way, God is always the one that feels it. So in this judgment scene, talking to disciples about disciples, of which as we look up here on the chart, there were those who were ready for judgment because they were diligent, they were faithful, and they were prepared. And when the Lord came, He found them prepared. And because of the goodness of their life, and it shows also, it's not enough just to believe that Jesus Christ is your Savior. It's not even enough to just simply be baptized. What were the things that were mentioned in these verses beginning with verse 35 and down. He's talking about things that we actually do. So the very conduct of our lives will be brought into judgment according to this passage of Scripture. It's no wonder then when we go to Revelation chapter 21, go to Revelation chapter 20, or chapter, yeah, chapter 21. I want you to notice how this judgment scene is worded here in the book of Revelation. I need to get me some more bookmarks. I remember having about six of those things. I just flipped that around there. Revelation chapter 20, or 20 rather. I said 21. Chapter 20, beginning of verse 11, it says, Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven had fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. And books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged, ladies and gentlemen, according to their what? Their works. Not their faith. They were judged according to their works by the things which are written in the books. In other words, we write our own judgment. We have the word of God by which Jesus says that he who rejects me and, uh, and uh, does not receive me and rejects my word has that which judges him. The word that I've spoken will judge him in the last day. John chapter 12, verse 48. The word that I've spoken will judge him in the last day. Well, the word he's spoken is right here. Basically, this is the measuring stick of life, our Bible. And in the judgment, we will be laid side by side with the word of God as to whether or not we have lived up to what he said or not, whether we are obedient or faithful to what he said or not. But evidently, he talks about other books. In one of them, and God doesn't really literally need books. There's not really a library in heaven in which he has to go in and get a card and somebody signs it and blow the dust off of him and check it out. God doesn't need a physical book. God's God. But so that we can understand what he's saying and it can drive it home for us, it's good for us to picture these books. The Word of God will be one of the books, the Lamb's Book of Life, in which if your name's written in it, you're going to be saved. That's going to be present there. But evidently, there's this idea that God's going to write down in His book the deeds of our lives. And we're going to be judged according to our works, He says, based on the things written in the book. Our conduct is what's going to also going to be brought to bear. But that does make sense to us. Write this down. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ to receive the things done in the body according to what we have done. Whether good or bad. According to what we have done. Whether good or bad. That's the idea that you see in the judgment. So while you have in the first parable of this chapter the idea of a, a, a diligent watchfulness. Watch therefore for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming, he says in verse 13. And you have the, the concept of either being faithful or unfaithful. All three of these men knew this man was going to return. It wasn't like, I don't know what ever happened to him. 
Every one of them knew he was going to come back. They didn't know when, but they knew he was coming back. And their duty was simply to be faithful to the task he set upon them until they can't return. And so in the, in the last parable, that's really the, that's really the end result of it. Because by the time the reality of verses 31 through 46 actually comes to bear, in other words, Jesus is here, it is then too late to be watchful. It's too late then for diligence. It's then too late for faithfulness. Because by the time the reality of this portion of the chapter comes to bear, our fate is sealed. So what is really important for us to realize is that in our watching and working and doing the Lord's will, generally just doing what He tells us to do, what He expects of us, it also involves our interrelationship with each other. He could have used a number of other illustrations here in this uh, pros and cons idea, this uh, saved and, and lost idea of Matthew 25, 31 through 46, but he chose the idea of serving him through serving each other. Which also goes to show something, ladies and gentlemen, that we are not able to worship God just to ourselves. I don't know how many times as a minister of the gospel I have heard this over the years, people that don't want to go to church or whatever. They just, I don't like the people there, they're hypocrites or whatever. And whatever excuse they give. And how many times people will say, well, I can, I can worship God anywhere. Well, that's true, you can. You can worship God anywhere. And it's times that you will be alone. There's times you might worship God in your private way as you're driving down the road and not a soul's in the car with you. That's true, you can worship God alone. But it was never God's intention for you to uh, exercise your faith alone. Moments of alone time will happen. Worship God as you're your private way as you're about to go to sleep at night or wake up in the morning, you might be all by yourself on the job someplace. Maybe you're an astronaut, the only guy left in the space station running around that thing. You can worship God up there by yourself. But you're not intended to be alone because the Lord adds to His body daily those who are being saved. Acts 2.47 He places us in the entity of His body, which is the church. We have an interrelationship that Paul speaks of with great fondness and detail, as he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, as we read so many times, verses 12 down to near the end of that chapter, as he's talking, we are, we are individual members, but we're one body. And though we're one body, we're members individually. But he shows the harmony, not only that we're related together in the body of Christ, but that we depend on each other. There are certain things that the body would fail to do and maybe even die if certain other members of our physical body ceased to function and were taken out. Can I survive without my heart? Take my heart out. I can survive without one kidney, most likely. They, they do that a lot. People will have kidney transplants. Somebody will voluntarily sacrifice one of theirs. You have two of them and, uh, you know, give that to help so, save somebody else's life. There's lesser... Lesser things that you can, you can survive without. Countless people have, uh, are, are living proof that you can live without certain members of your body. Gallbladder, appendix, hair. You, know, you can live without these things, right? You can survive, but you cannot survive without your vital organs. And to be honest with you, in, in the body of Christ, everyone, regardless of what, you on the hand, on the foot, whatever, you can live without a hand, you can live without a foot physically, but in the body of Christ, we're all vital. And if you are not a part of that, you're not helping the body to survive or thrive. So in the judgment scene, do not think that I, at any point, well, I can worship God on my own. I don't need the church. Is to say, I don't need Christ because you are a member of His body. And it's impossible to please the head who is attached to the body and say, I don't need your body. I just need you. I just need, need the head only. You can't. You can't separate them. So there's an obligation you will see. Our obligation directly in terms of our diligence for the coming of the Lord, our service to the Lord directly, and even serving the Lord through each other, serving each other. That is the idea presented in the judgment scene. And so as we consider this, I want you to think about this in the last remark or two. I'd already read that other parable there in Luke chapter 12, verses 16 through 21. I bet you thought I was going to give a sermon on that one, didn't you? <laughs> I like that one because I want to come back to it. Notice that in the parable of this rich man that he had no regard 
Not only toward his fellow man, he had no regard for even God. He was all about himself. I ask you, when you now contemplate that parable and throw it in with this parable here, which group would this man fall in with? Would he be on the right hand or on the other hand? This man had absolutely no regard for his fellow men, uh, mankind. He had no regard for his brethren. He had no regard toward God. He was completely self-centered. Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then will, uh, whose will those things be that you've acquired over all your life? And it comes down to that idea because when we look at the idea of the judgment coming, surely looking forward to it. If we're living our life now when we're not really that diligent about His return, we're negligent really. We just, we just assume there's going to be tomorrow. I mean, it's happened how many times? How many tomorrows have you had? Don't get your calculators out and try to figure it out. How many, how many tomorrows have you had? We assume there's going to be tomorrow. I, I mean, I, I anticipate that there there will likely be a, a Monday morning, right? May not come though. But we do. We sometimes live our life with this just uh, nonchalant approach to the Lord's return. And maybe we're only partially faithful, not altogether faithful. Jesus only talked about true, complete faithfulness versus complete abandon to that. But what about the guy who's in the middle? He's kind of working at it and kind of not. If you'll notice carefully in that parable, the second parable of this chapter, 100% faithfulness was the only thing that gained the uh, inner in you faithful. 100% dependent or faithfulness. We do. We're very lighthearted about His return. Sometimes we're lighthearted to approach about his, his coming. Where do we expect to be when He actually comes? What did we think would happen? If you can just kind of float through life and then at the end, they're like, yeah, it'll be right at the end. If you want to make sure you're going to heaven when He does return, we've got to prepare for that now. And that seems to be the driving force of this. Don't be like the guy who just lived for himself and stored up all these treasures for himself and all the goods for himself and thinking he had years to come and the Lord says, fool, tonight you die. So, in com as we compare these parables quickly and especially the last one we've been looking at, I ask you, which one of these best describes you? Which one of these best describes you? As you're getting your, your hymn books out now and you're about ready to sing the song of invitation, that's the, that's the idea that we need to have in our minds. Which one... On either side of these, you know, in these columns here, which one best describes you? Are you diligent? Are you faithful? Are you prepared? Or are you negligent and you're unfaithful and you're unprepared? Are you somewhere in the middle there in which you're, if you're, if you fail even a little bit, you failed at all? The only one that is focused on in salvation is the one who's diligent and faithful and prepared. Which one best describes you? That's how I leave it with you at this hour. And if there's anyone here this morning who has a desire to turn their life to Christ or be restored or uh, rededicate their, their walk with Christ. We encourage you to make that known. We're going to sing this invitation song and encourage you if you want to come forward. We'll do what we can to spiritually help you. But if you'll come forward now as Tim leads us in our invitation song, stand and come if you will.